Hi, welcome back to chapter 11 of the Little Book of Valuation. In this chapter, I want to focus on cyclical and commodity companies. You think, what do they share in common? With both groups, you're at the mercy of a macro component. With cyclical companies, you're at the mercy of what the economic cycle is. If the economy is in a recession, cyclical companies do badly. When it's doing well, you do well as well. With commodity companies, the commodity price will drive how you do. If you're looking at an oil company and oil prices are high, your earnings will be high. If they're down, your earnings will be down as well. The other aspect, and this is true especially for commodity companies, is because you're looking at a finite resource. An oil company, for instance, there's only a certain amount of oil in the ground. You could argue that the perpetuity assumption is an overreach. That even for a large oil company, there's only a certain amount of oil in the ground you can take out. So rather than use a perpetuity, you might use a 40-year growth period at the end of your time. So those are factors to look at when you think about valuation and pricing. And here are some specific issues. When you value or price a commodity or a cyclical company and use the most recent year's numbers, which is what we're trained to do in, in much evaluation, those recent year numbers are going to be heavily affected by what commodity price changes were during that period and economic growth was during the period. In other words, it can be really high or really low, not because of what the company did, but because of macro forces. And the volatility that you're going to see in the earnings numbers, the book value numbers, everything caused by the commodity price or the cyclicality will affect your equity values and debt values. Your company can go from being incredibly safe to on the verge of bankruptcy over the course of a year because oil prices went from $100 to $35 a barrel. The same thing would show up in pricing. When you look at commodity cyclical companies, they look cheapest at the peak of the oil price. And markets are not being crazy. When oil prices peak, they're pricing the company the expectation that oil price will come down. The multiples will be highest at the very bottom of the cycle, again because markets assume normalization. So those are all issues that will show up repeatedly with commodity and cyclical companies. So let's talk about some solutions. When you sit down to value an oil company or a cyclical company, rather than use the trailing 12 months, you might decide to use average earnings over time. Average. So in other words, using averages rather than the most recent 12 months will get rid of some of the ups and downs that you get because of the cyclicality. Now, of course, when you average things out and you're averaging dollar values, if your oil company is getting bigger over time or smaller over time, you're missing that. So rather than look at the average dollar earnings over time, you might look at the average operating margins over time. What does it allow you to do? Rather than average earnings, you're averaging the margins, you're applying the average margin to the revenues in the most recent year. You're normalizing, but you're normalizing using something that's been scaled to the size of the company. The, if we, when you have a young or a particularly volatile oil company or cyclical company, you might draw on industry averages. So rather than look at your company's margins in history, you might look at the average margins across all steel companies over the cycle and use it at least as your target margin when you're valuing one of these companies. So let's take an example. Let's suppose you were valuing Toyota in 2009. In 2009, Toyota was widely regarded as the best-run automobile company in the world. Remember, this was pre-Tesla coming on the horizon or at least breaking through. Toyota was regarded as the best-run automobile company in the world. But 2009 was an awful year. You're coming out of crisis. And Toyota was not immune. It was actually losing money in 2009. So if I use the trailing 12-month numbers, Toyota looks like it should be worth nothing, which is not quite fair. So here's how I value Toyota. I looked at the average pre-tax operating margin that Toyota had between 1998 and 2009. So basically, this is the margin on average across its entire time period was 7.33%. Then I took their actual 12-month revenues and I multiplied by that margin. So I'm normalizing based on the revenues today. So when I do that, I come up with this normalized operating income of 1.661 value. I did my entire valuation as if that were my earnings for Toyota. Remember, Toyota was already one of the largest automobile companies in the world. So I assumed it was in stable growth, growing at 1.5%, but growing its normalized income, not its last year's income. And I assumed its return on capital is equal to its cost of capital because the automobile business was in trouble. It's very difficult for a company to earn more than its cost of capital. In effect, here's how it plays out. 
There's my normalized operating income, 1,661 million. I'm growing it at 1.5% because that's my growth rate in perpetuity. My tax rate at that time for Japanese companies was 40%. And because I want to keep growing at 1.5% with a 5% return on capital, I have to reinvest about a third of my money every year. So the numerator put together is my free cash flow to the firm. Discounted back at the cost of capital minus the growth rate, I get a value today. So this is the terminal value equation, but it gives me the value right now of 19.64 billion yen. Normalized earnings playing out in free cash flow. Now, if I want to get from that value to the value of equity, I do what I always do, which is tie up loose ends. I add the cash. In the case of Toyota, there are a lot of cross holdings. And then I subtract out debt and minority interest. Minority interest comes from the fact that you've consolidated a company and this is the portion of the company that doesn't belong to you. I subtract those numbers out. And I divide by the number of shares. I get a value per share of 4,735 yen. Well above the market price at that time. But this reflects normalized earnings. Now one thing I am doing is I'm assuming instant normalization. So if in 2009 you'd felt it'll take at least two years before you get to those normalized earnings, here's a simplistic adjustment you can make. Take the 4,735 yen, discount it back two years at your cost to capital, which is 5.09%, and get the value today. And that'll take care of the time value of money, of having to wait for normalization. Now, with commodity companies, normalization often is in reference to the price of the commodity. So if you value an oil company, when you want to normalize things, the question you're asking is, what is a normal price for oil? Let's be quite honest. That is a question to which the answers become more and more difficult to get. The way in which oil companies used to get this answer was by looking at the average oil price across the cycle. The assumption was oil prices move through cycles, but they always revert back to the cycle. You see why this has become more difficult? Because with climate change and the pressures on oil, it's entirely possible that the old cycles will not kick in, but that is one way to get it. The other is to base a normalized price of oil based on demand and supply. There's a demand for oil from all of the different parts of the world. There's a supply of oil and prices set by demand and supply. There should be a normal price. I'm not suggesting it's going to be easy to do, but one way in which you can value an oil company is by normalizing the price of oil, feeding it into the revenue. So rather than use the actual reported revenues, you multiply the number of barrels of oil produced by the normalized price. It is a variation of what I did for Toyota. So let's try this. And, without, I mean, and we'll talk about how it's going to play out in this particular example by trying to value Royal Dutch Shell which generated about 64.4 billion in operating income on revenues of 381 billion in 2022. So those are the trailing 12 month numbers. This is one catch. During the period, during those 12 months, the average oil price was about $101 per barrel. By August of 2023, when I was valuing Royal Dutch, that oil price had dropped to 81. You're saying, so what? You see those revenues and operating income, they reflect $101 oil price, but you're now at $81. If I just use the trailing 12-month numbers to value Royal Dutch, I'll overvalue the company because oil prices are down 20% from those numbers. You're saying, there's no choice. What else can we do? Here's what I did. I went back and collected the average oil price and revenues and operating income at Royal Dutch going back to the 1980s. So you see the chart laid out there. And then I ran a regression of Royal Dutch revenues against the average oil price. You say, what does that tell me? At least during this period, every $1 increase in the oil price increased my revenues by about 4.17 million. So basically, if you tell me what the average oil price is, I can tell you what the revenues for this company should be. So my oil price is $100, 100 times 4.17 billion is 470. You can basically get the revenues based on the oil price by looking at the history of Royal Dutch. So what I did was I actually went in and plugged in the actual oil price, $81. I got a predicted revenue. Rather than use their actual revenues, I'm going to use the predicted revenues. And over time, I assumed the margins would converge in, down on the average margin that Royal Dutch has reported through all cycles, about 10%. So I've got my revenues, I've got my operating margin, I get the operating income, I net out the taxes, and then I do all the conventional calculations. I get a free cash for the firm and the terminal value, but the key thing that I'm doing that's different here 
is rather than use the trailing 12 month numbers, I'm using the numbers that you'd have seen based on an $81 oil price. I am a great believer in being oil price neutral when I value oil companies. What does that mean? I don't want to thrust my views on oil prices into this valuation and tell you to buy Royal Dutch because I think oil prices are going to go up. This is my valuation of Royal Dutch conditioned on the oil price being $81 a barrel. And the value per share that I get, especially when I bring in the terminal value with the 2% growth in perpetuity, gives me a terminal value of 325 billion, the value per share that I get is about $75 reflecting the fact that I've normalized the, the revenues for the, for the current oil price, lower than what it was in the last 12 months. Now, when, when, when you see this valuation, a logical question to ask is, what will happen to this value per share if I change the oil price? In my case, that's easy to answer, right? You change the oil price, I would restate the revenues of that oil price and tell you what the value per share is. Not surprisingly, higher oil prices lead to higher values per share. Lower oil prices lead to lower values per share. Or framed differently, you can look at the current stock price and say, what would the oil price need to be for me to break even? It's a flexible way in which you can deal with the fact that commodity prices are shifting constantly. And your job is to come up with the most undervalued oil company, the most undervalued coal mining company, given what the price of oil and coal are right now. Now in the context of pricing commodity companies, you're going to run into the same issues you ran into with intrinsic valuation. Now if you're comparing across commodity companies, if they're all roughly the same in terms of growth and risk, and you normalize earnings across these companies, they should trade at roughly the same multiple of normalized earnings, assuming you've normalized right across companies. But the more general case, which I think is going to be the more common occurrence, growth and risk differences will persist even after normalizing. So you'd expect to see differences, and the differences show up as follows. Oil companies that have riskier earnings. You think, where does the risk come from? It might come from the fact that you get your oil in the riskiest parts of the world. Should trade at lower multiples of earnings on oil companies with more stable earnings. The Nigerian oil company should trade at a lower multiple of earnings than the Norwegian oil company, assuming the first gets its oil from Nigeria and the second from Norway. We'd also expect to see oil companies higher growth potential trade at higher multiples of earnings. Think, where does the growth potential come from? It comes from how much untapped oil that they have, reserves of oil. We can already see that to price oil companies, not only do you need to get a sense of what they earned last year, You'd also have to get a sense of where they got their oil, as well as how much, ex, you know, how much excess reserves, new reserves they have in place, because those will come into play in whether you find an oil company to be cheap or expensive. So let's try this for Royal Dutch, right? So I took um, about a dozen large oil companies, and you can see Royal Dutch are trading at 6.93 times earnings at about 1.04 times book value. And because they all reflect the oil price, I didn't even bother normalizing. They're, in a sense, all comparable. Now, if I look just at the price to book ratio and I compare it to the median, it looks like Royal Dutch is mildly undervalued on a price earnings and a price to book ratio. As I mean, it's about fairly valued on an enterprise value to sales ratio. And it's actually slightly overvalued on an EV to EBITDA multiple. You say, what do I do with that? Get used to it. Pricing using different metrics can give you different numbers. It looks, depending on which multiple you look, I, Royal Dutch goes from being mildly undervalued to mildly overvalued. Now you can already see why when somebody prices a company and uses a multiple, you got to push back. You cannot just assume that they pick the most logical multiple because they might have an agenda. If you want something to be cheap or expensive, you pick the multiple that best fits that story. Now one final point about commodity companies in particular. When you value a commodity company, an oil company for instance, you take the oil reserves and you take the existing oil price, you value the company given where the oil price is today. And there are times where you will undervalue oil companies because you use the current price, especially when oil prices have dropped substantially. So let's say you were looking at oil companies in March of 2020 when oil prices were $35 a barrel. Many oil companies, none of their reserves were viable. In fact, if you value these companies based on the $35 oil price, you're going to undervalue these companies. And here's why. 
At a $35 oil price, it's true, the reserves are non-viable, but oil price are volatile. There's an optionality here, which is even non-viable reserves have value because oil prices could change. That optionality will basically mean that every oil company, on top of the intrinsic value, there will be a premium reflecting that optionality. I can tell you what drives that optionality. The more undeveloped reserves you have, the greater the optionality. The greater the variance in oil prices, the greater the optionality. When you think about natural resource companies, not only is it critical that you look at what they have and what they extract from the ground, which is a discounted cash flow value of the company, but you should also look at the reserves, especially non-viable ones, and think about the optionality in those reserves and how much they will add to your value. I hope you found the session useful, and thank you very much for listening.